So, we have already seen what it means for two vector spaces V and W to be isomorphic to each other. We have developed the notion of an invertible linear transformation. Uh, in this video, we will explore how an, a linear transformation being invertible reflects upon the matrix associated to it. So, we begin by recalling the definition of an invertible matrix. Let us start by a recollection definition. So, let A be an M cross N matrix. We say that a matrix B Uh, matrix or rather an n cross m matrix B is the inverse of f of a if a b is the identity matrix of size m and b a is the identity matrix of size n. So, A is an M cross N matrix, B is an N cross M matrix. If you look at the product of these matrices AB, it will just turn out to be an M cross M matrix and we demand that that matrix be the identity matrix. Similarly, B A is demanded to be the identity matrix of size n. So, we say that the matrix B is then an inverse, is the inverse of the matrix A. So, we then say that A is an, is, the, is an invertible matrix. So, an immediate uh, exercise which will follow this is to prove that the matrix a has a unique inverse. So, the, the techniques uh, to prove have been developed uh, and used many times. So, you should also use the theorem which was proved in the last video wherein we showed that matrix multiplication was or is associative. So, the exercise is to show that the inverse of a matrix a is unique. So, start off with two potential inverses B and B prime and prove that B is equal to B prime. Alright, so why did we talk about an invertible matrix to begin with? So, as is to be expected, uh, our goal would be to show that an invertible linear transformation has uh, an invertible matrix associated to it. So, we will come to that before that uh, let me just uh, just for the sake of completion let me give an example. So, let A be a matrix given by uh, 1, 2, 3 in the diagonals let me make my life easy here. Then A inverse is equal to 1 0 0 0 1 by 2 0 0 0 1 by 3. Right. So, this is a familiar concept for you most probably from your high school. So, let me not spend too many, uh, uh, let us spend time on uh, too many examples. Let me directly jump into the theorem here which essentially captures the relationship between invertible linear transformations and invertible matrices. So, let T from V to W be a linear transformation between finite dimensional vector spaces. V and W. Let us fix uh, an ordered basis alpha and beta of uh, V and W. Suppose alpha and beta 
or finite uh, that's already redundant it's already known to be finite ordered basis of v and w respectively then then the theorem states that t is an invertible linear transformation if and only if the matrix associated to t with respect to beta alpha and beta is an invertible matrix so if and only if the matrix t so alpha beta is an invertible matrix not just this we exactly know what the inverse of this matrix is moreover the inverse of alpha beta the inverse of this matrix this just turns out to be the matrix associated to the inverse of t the inverse linear transformation of t so this is just the matrix of t inverse not re recall that t inverse will now be a map from w to v and therefore this will be beta alpha so we exactly know what the inverse of our uh, matrix corresponding to this linear this particular linear transformation is so let's give a proof of this statement so we are given alpha and beta so let's uh, once and for all for in the in the context of this proof let alpha be equal to say v1 to vn and beta be equal to w1 to wm the ordered basis of v and w respectively all right so let's see what our goal is so let's first assume that t is uh, an invertible linear transformation uh, the one i am un underlining in green and let's prove that the matrix associated to t is an invertible matrix okay so so let t be an invertible linear transformation what does it mean to say that uh, a linear transformation is invertible it means that then there exists an inverse and we know that the inverse is unique so, and suppose t inverse from w to v be its inverse what do we know about this inverse when composed with t it gives us identity on both sides so if you look at t t inverse then t t inverse is just the identity map of w and similarly t inverse t is just the identity of v by the very definition we also know that the identity map of w so we know so okay let's see what is t t inverse from beta alpha so recall that t t inverse is a map from w to itself and sorry so it will not be beta alpha it will be beta beta but this is just the matrix of the identity map with respect to the basis beta and we know what that particular uh, matrix is the matrix of the identity with respect to beta will just turn out to be the m cross m identity matrix but we also have already seen how the matrix corresponding to the linear transformation is behave under composition so let me just note that down recall that t t inverse beta beta is equal to t inverse from beta to alpha and t from beta from alpha to beta and therefore we have t alpha beta 
times t inverse beta alpha is equal to the identity matrix of m identity matrix of size m a similar argument just noted a similar argument tells us gives us that t inverse beta alpha t alpha beta is the identity matrix of size n because t inverse t will just turn out to be the identity map of the vector space v and with this will uh, this will hence tell us and therefore the matrix t alpha beta is invertible and what is the inverse with inverse t alpha beta inverse being equal to the inverse of the matrix of the inverse from star this is from star all right so we have proved one half of the theorem which states that if t is a t is an invertible linear transformation then the matrix associated to t with respect to alpha beta is invertible moreover if uh, uh, t alpha beta is the matrix the inverse of that matrix will be the matrix of the inverse corresponding to beta alpha okay so now let's prove the other direction so what is the other direction the other direction demands that if you start off with an invertible uh, m cross n matrix uh, corresponding to a linear transformation then the matrix uh, the linear transformation is also an invertible linear transformation okay so let t alpha beta be the matrix of t uh, sorry yeah of course this is the matrix of t with respect to alpha beta let me not write that uh, again and again let this matrix be invert be an invertible matrix with inverse given by b so let's give some uh, name to alpha or rather the vectors let's list down the vectors in the ordered basis alpha and beta so let uh, alpha be recall that alpha is an ordered basis of v which has dimension n and let v1 v2 up to vn correspond to the vectors in the ordered basis alpha and uh, beta similarly be some w1 to recall that w is of dimension m so this will be some list of m vectors so let alpha and beta be ordered basis of uh, v and uh, w consisting of v1 to vn as the vectors in alpha and w1 to wm as the vectors in beta and we know that uh, there is an inverse to the given matrix associated to t corresponding to this uh, these bases so let's see what the entries of this uh, matrix is so let b be equal to something like b11 so where is uh, uh, what is b uh, b is the inverse of uh, the matrix uh, associated to t which is going to be an m cross n matrix so this is going to be an n cross m matrix this is going to be n1 nm right now let's define uh, a function so define a function s from w to v in the following manner we will try to use we will invoke one of the theorems we have proved in one of the previous videos namely which says which says that if you are given a basis of uh, the domain in this case w 
and say basis consisting of say w1 w2 up to wm and suppose you are given vectors say uh, x1 x2 or rather w uh, v is already used u1 u2 up to um then there exists a unique linear transformation which maps wi to ui so let's use that to define this particular map s by defining what s is on a basis of w so recall that recall that to define a linear transformation on w linear transformation from v to, from w to v it is enough to describe the function s on a basis of w but we are already given a basis of w so consider s of w j this is how we would like to uh, go about defining our linear map s but what would s w j be when we know that uh, the matrix of S should be B. So, that is our goal, right? So, we would like to somehow construct an inverse of T. Now, what is the information we have? We are, the information we have is the inverse of the matrix corresponding to T. And we are already uh, familiar with what the matrix of this inverse should be. It will be the inverse of the matrix. So, our expectation should be that the matrix of S should be B corresponding to beta alpha. And if that is to be the case, let us see what SWJ should be. Let, let me show you what uh, B is on the top and let me define SWJ by keeping B above. So, this will just turn out to be equal to B1J V1 plus B2J V2 plus b n j v j which let us call it as u j by one of those theorems which we proved earlier then there exists a unique linear transformation s from w to v so let us call this u j such that s w j is equal to u j. My claim now is that this matrix, this linear transformation s is the inverse of t. So, how do we go about doing, uh, proving that? So, let us see what uh, the matrix corresponding to t s is. So, consider t s with respect to beta alpha. So, we know that T s is now a map linear transformation from w to itself. So, this is not beta alpha, this is beta beta and we know that this is the composition of two linear transformations. So, this will be s beta alpha to the right and T alpha beta and we know that this is equal to T alpha beta times b which you should go back and check by the very definition of our s here the matrix of s turns out to be b right so this is equal to t alpha beta times b but what was b b was exactly the inverse of our matrix t alpha beta which is just equal to the identity map of size m but we know some linear transformation which gives us this particular matrix which is just going to be equal to the identity map from w to itself corresponding to beta so from here it's straightforward to check that ts is equal to iw
So it's an exercise for you to see that this is equal on each of the basis vectors and therefore by the R uh, that's just straightforward. I wouldn't want to call it an exercise, but nevertheless you should check this particular arrow carefully. Similarly, we will be able to conclude that ST is equal to ID and therefore S is the inverse of T which gives T is an invertible linear transformation that completes our proof. All right, so now given a matrix A, there is a very natural linear transformation which can be associated to it, namely LA. So this theorem tells us that A is uh, an inverter, so let me write it down as a corollary. So let A be an M cross N matrix. Then a is invertible if and only if L A is invertible. Not just that, we know more, we know exactly how or what L A is. Also L A inverse, the inverse of the linear transformation L A will be the linear transformation corresponding to A bus. Okay. So the proof is just uh, a direct application, is it is it's a corollary, it is a direct application of uh, the previous theorem. So the first part is fairly straightforward, notice that with respect, so it is just finally boiling down to the choice of the right basis. So let alpha and beta be the standard basis, standard basis of Rn and Rm respectively and uh, just boils down to checking that with respect to the standard basis, the matrix of L A is just A and the previous theorem tells us that L A inverse, L A alpha beta the whole inverse, the matrix inverse which is equal to A inverse. Now this is equal to L A inverse beta alpha by our theorem which we have just proved. But we also know that A inverse is the matrix of the linear transformation corresponding to A inverse, but let me write it down L A inverse with respect to say beta alpha is nothing but A inverse and therefore L A inverse beta alpha is equal to the matrix of the inverse of the linear transformation L A with respect to beta alpha and from there again on the basis it is equal and therefore it will be equal everywhere and that establishes the corollary. Another corollary uh, is that, so let me just note it down, another corollary states that if A is an M cross N uh, it is a corollary to this corollary which states that if A is an invertible M cross N matrix and M is necessarily equal to N. So let us see how that is. So let A be an invertible M cross N matrix. Then M is equal to N. So by the previous theorem, so let us look at a proof, by the previous theorem A is invertible, is an invertible matrix
if and only if LA, so where is LA from? LA is a map from Rn to Rn. So LA is an invertible linear transformation. Now, what do we know about uh, uh, isomorphic vector spaces? So, we know that uh, two linear transform uh, two vector spaces are isomorphic or in other words there exists an invertible linear transformation between them if and only if their dimensions are the same. So, which we have proved in one of the uh, videos in this week. This is if and only if dimension of R n which is equal to n. So, dimension of R n is equal to dimension of R n. But what is dimension of R n? That is n and what is dimension of R m? That is m and therefore, this is if and only if n is equal to m. So, A is an invertible linear transformation. Okay. So, there is a slight error which uh, one should uh, be very careful about. So, this will tell us that dimension of Rn is equal to dimension of Rm. It is not an if and only if statement. You could have La which is not necessarily an invertible linear transformation even though the domain and the range are Rn. So, for example, look at the uh, map La corresponding to the 0 matrix that will uh, not be an invertible linear transformation. So, this direction of uh, the implication here which I am now circling in green one should be very careful I had written an if and only if there which is not the case. Right. So, this implies that dimension of Rn is equal to dimension of Rm which is if and only if n is equal to m. So, we have effectively shown that if A is an invertible m cross n matrix then n is necessarily equal to m. All right. So, in the proof of the theorem which we proved just now, the theorem which stated that if uh, T or rather T is an invertible linear transformation if and only if the matrix associated to T is invertible, we used uh, an argument uh, to construct uh, a specific inverse linear transformation of T. We, we shall use that uh, style of construction to prove that the vector space of all linear transformations between V and W which we had seen earlier and we had given a name L of V comma W that is isomorphic to all M cross N matrices over R. So, that is the next theorem that we will be proving. So, recall that L of V comma W denoted the vector space of all linear transformations from V to W. So, this theorem tells us that L of V w is isomorphic to the matrices of size m cross n when V and w are respectively of uh, dimension m and n. So, let us see what the statement is. So, let V and w be finite dimensional vector spaces. Suppose the dimension of V is equal to n and the dimension of uh, W is equal to m. So, let dimension of V is equal to n and dimension of W be equal to m. Then the theorem states that L of V comma W is isomorphic to the matrices over R of size m cross n. 
Okay, let us give a proof of this, the proof is quite straightforward. We have seen the idea that is being used in this proof just a few minutes back, so it is just going to be a imitation of that. So, let us start by fixing an ordered basis. So, let alpha be equal to v1 to vn and beta equal to w1 to wm be a basis b basis of v and w respectively. Let us now define a map phi. So, define capital phi from L of V W into the M cross N matrices over R. So, recall that M cross N matrices over R was a vector space consisting of all M cross N matrices and uh, it was uh, having a basis with uh, all the uh, matrices with 1 in say i j and 0 elsewhere. So, there will be m n of them. So, the dimension of the vector space on the right is actually m n. So, let us define a map phi from L of v w into m cross n over r by what you should be expecting. Phi of uh, linear transformation t is just going to be the matrix of t responding to alpha beta. So, we have seen that uh, phi is a linear transformation. In another guise, we have already seen it. Let us check that phi is a linear transformation. So, so see that P of S plus T is just going to be equal to the matrix of S plus T alpha beta. And we have already seen that this is equal to S alpha beta plus T alpha beta which is equal to P of S plus P of T. And similarly, the scalar multiple, so this is for all S and T in L of VW. And similarly, P of C times T is nothing but C times P of T for all T in L of VW and C in the scalars. So, what is uh, phi of ct? It is going to be the matrix of ct with respect to alpha and beta, which is going to be c times the matrix of t with, res with respect to alpha and beta, which is nothing but c times pt. So, we have seen these two uh, in, the, in the first video of this week. So, we have what we have done just now is to establish that uh, our map phi which we just defined is a linear transformation from L of Vw into the M cross N matrices over R. So, what remains to show is that uh, it is an isomorphism. So, invoking another result uh, which we have already shown, we will prove that phi is both injective and surjective and thereby proving that an injective and a surjective linear transformation is an invertible linear transformation. You will use that result to prove that phi is then an invertible linear transformation. Okay, so, the injectivity comes by noting that the, so this I will leave it as an exercise for you to check that the null space of phi is necessarily the 0 linear transformation. is the 0. So, this is the 0 linear transformation. Just notice what the matrix corresponding to uh, phi will turn out to be if uh, the, mat uh, the linear transformation is being mapped to the 0 vector, uh, 0 matrix. It will just be the matrix with 0 entries, which means that every basis vector is being sent to the 0 vector and therefore, the linear transformation is the 0 linear transformation. So, this null, this, this particular exercise establishes that 
phi is injective. Notice that we have already shown that uh, phi is a linear transformation and this tells us that phi is injective. And how about surjectivity? So, let the surjectivity, let us now next to surjectivity. So, let us take some arbitrary m cross n matrix. So, let A be an m cross n matrix. We have seen this technique, this is what I was talking about a few minutes back. So, let A be the matrix given by these entries and did we give what the vectors, yes. So, V1 to Vn and uh, W1 to Wm are the vectors in the ordered basis corresponding to alpha and beta. So, define, let us define a map T from V to W where T V j will just turn out to be equal to A 1 j W 1 plus A 2 j W 2 plus a n j or other m j w n. So, check that the matrix of T corresponding to alpha beta ok. So, wait before that I have just defined what T is on the basis vectors alpha and by one of the theorems we have proved earlier there is a unique linear transformation which maps each of the vj's to the vector which I have just put in the bracket. Let us call it uj. So, there x is a unique linear transformation, there x is a unique linear transformation by one of the theorems proved earlier. So, it is a unique linear transformation T which maps. So, so, notice that here I have only defined T for the basis elements v1, v2 up to vn. And with that there exists a unique linear transformation T from V to W such that T of V j is equal to A 1 j W 1 plus A n j W m. And what is the matrix of uh, T with respect to alpha beta? Check that this is equal to A. But what does it mean to say that the matrix of T with respect to alpha beta is A? It means that I e phi of T is equal to A and that shows that our map phi is surjective. So, we have shown both injectivity and surjectivity and thus phi is an isomorphism. So, what we have essentially shown, it is a very powerful result, let me just show you the result once more. This theorem tells us that the uh, vector space of all linear transformations from V to W is isomorphic to the m cross n matrix of our R. And as a corollary, so let us stop with the corollary which, which is a direct consequence of the theorem, it tells us what the dimension of L of V W is dimension of L of V comma W, remember that two matrices are isomorphic if and only if the dimensions are the same. So, this is nothing but dimension of the m cross n matrices over R which is equal to m times n. So, this has already proved the result corollary states that the dimension of L of V W is n. Okay, let me stop here.